Good morning, everyone. I'm Randy McCord, one of the pastors at Table Rock, and I'm here with Bill Muir, our senior pastor. We're going to review the uh, lesson that Bill gave us today from Colossians 1 through 4 and talk about some of those points there. So, Bill, you seem to be a real fan of Colossians. I am now. Colossians 3, and uh, we're going to go through that. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read the first uh, four verses that you used as your text for a reason. Okay. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Now, I think you used a different translation, but the meaning is the same. You have made a lot of fans by insisting we memorize this text. And your comment today, I want to get it right, I wrote it down, is this ain't going away. Tell me why it's so important that we memorize this text. Well, I think memorization is, is important, not of necessarily this text, any text, in terms of it gives us a basis to meditate throughout a day without needing to have our Bibles in our hands, or even our phone Bibles. So someone can, I do now, having memorized the first four verses, mm -hmm. even though it got to nine and then it collapsed on me, but I'm at it back to that. four and I can, and it, it is what, uh, it allows me just to reflect on it and go backwards on verses and go forward on verses and do the four verses and continue to pick. So I think there's something beautiful I'm discovering as a teacher that when I memorize and I make mistakes and I make a lot of them, it, it makes me engage the passage differently. So it's mm -hmm. not just the memorization, it's the engagement. And it's not just the engagement, but the reflection. And not just the reflection, it's the pondering. Right. So I just think script memorization becomes the basis of some good stuff. I agree with that. And I think it's not a common thing that most people do in our society today. It's easy to look things up. But I also think that in my own life, uh, you... The comment that you made later on that you become what you think about mm -hmm. is a powerful comment, some good and some bad in that word. And if you are thinking about these things, that's near the top of your mind. But it is a habit, don't you think? Yeah. I, I, the ability I think to memorize. what I've been, I've been struck by in this study, it, even in these first four verses, is how much our thinking shapes us, both our soul oh, yes. and our spirit and our countenance. And our thoughts, one of the quotes that I didn't give today is the unexamined thoughts and desires we have can get us into as much trouble as the thoughts and desires we have. And most people haven't stopped to think what is it they're really wanting and what is it they're really thinking. Mm -hmm. and, and yet even those thoughts impact our decision making. Right. Do you find and do you think that controlling of our thoughts is difficult. Yeah. Well, I would say it gets less difficult as we do it properly. So if you start out with your clothes covered in, in uh, dirt, it's a lot harder to clean up than if you just scuff yourself right. or brush right. against a car. It's true. I think some people that have um, spent their whole life bitter or uh, in pornography or um, Whatever the, their thought process pondering is, mm -hmm. it, it, the more that's there that's wrong, the harder and longer it is to clean it out. I mean, I, 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 I think, think people true. grow up in a right. culture that thinks they can reset everything with a push of the button, you know, like a video game. If I don't play it right, I just reset it, it all right. goes to zero. And I go, no, right. we carry all that stuff with us and we got to dismantle them word by word, thought by thought, picture by picture, choice by choice. So that part is difficult, which is, I think, a good motivation not to go down any roads that I'm going to have to backpedal back up. That's true. We're going to come to that again in a little bit. You stated early on in your lesson today that there is a one-word summary of these four verses. Mm -hmm. And that word you said was confidence. Mm -hmm. Okay. How would you relate, contrast, or orient that statement of confidence to the concept of the New Testament that 
the success to Christianity depends on our faith. What's the relationship between faith and confidence? Well, I think faith is confidence. I think I think faith is somewhat of an abstract word. I mean, we, we can think we have it or we don't have it. And I would say to somebody, well, how much trust do you, not do you have faith in that chair can hold you, but how much trust do you have in that chair can hold you? How much confidence do you have in that chair mm -hmm. to hold you? So I think confidence, in, one way to look at it would be confidence is even a deeper faith than just belief, which is where I, I think most people believe. They, they operate on a belief, and I think the, the faith journey is this ever-growing, deepening, trusting, deepening confidence, deepening conviction, deepening, you know, and that becomes part of the journey. Okay. I think that's true. Faith is a sort of a nebulous and very religious word. Confidence, it seems to me, is more of a practical, real-life word. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, confidence is a very practical application of faith, but we can have levels of confidence. Yes, no question. Okay. Yes. Is it okay to have levels of faith? Yeah, I think the scriptures indicate there's a little faith, which would imply a big faith. Mm -hmm. There's a um, there's a immature faith. There's right. a growing faith. There's a weak faith. I mean, I think this, the beauty of Scripture is it, it doesn't, a false faith, mm -hmm. James would say. So I don't think faith is a one-size-fits-all. I think, I think Paul tells us, commands us to investigate our faith and to see, mm -hmm. to see what it's made up of. So yes, there are levels to faith. I agree. And, and it's possible to increase faith. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Do you think you can increase faith or confidence without having stresses and struggles to do that? I would say scripture would say that stress and struggles and temptations and trials are a means by which God purifies our faith, mm -hmm. gets rid of the dross, okay. makes it stronger, and creates a... Um, a solidarity in it that wouldn't be there without those things. So they, you know, James says in James chapter one, Philip's translation is when you encounter trials, welcome them, mm -hmm. knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Right. So that becomes part of that strengthening, purifying, solidifying process that I, I think, it, you know, it's like the people buy those hats that says one size fits all. And I think right. we think faith is one size fits all. But the truth I is, I think, think scripture is. makes yeah. faith much more complicated. I don't think it is. So the matter of confidence, let's use the word confidence for a minute. Okay. Uh, we know that you referred also to it. and We'll get to that in a minute. In Ephesians 6, it talks about in the very fact that we are in the world trying to live as Christians, we are involved in a struggle. Yep. And this struggle is against spiritual forces. Yep. The spiritual forces are led, of course, as we're led by Christ, they're led by Satan. Mm -hmm. And we know that he has a particular trait that he uses, which is lying. Mm -hmm. So speak just for a minute about how his process of lying relates to the need for us to have confidence in Christ spoken of in these first four verses. How well, do I, those appear to each other? I think Satan is the deceiver, the tempter, the accuser, mm -hmm. uh, the liar. You know, so those are those adjectives. So I think Satan's going to use anything in his apparatus to weaken, dilute, deny any of those great truths. So I'm not saved. I got to work to be saved. Jesus isn't sufficient. Jesus didn't die for sins. Jesus wasn't resurrected. I mean, the whole list of what he will throw at us mm -hmm. to weaken us is, is a part of his strategy. Right. right. So we have to have confidence that Christ is real and that we're part of Christ and all the things that that text brings into bear at the same time that Satan is going to either overtly or subtly be attacking that level of confidence. Exactly. So it's not a one and done kind of a process, right? Like, it's sort of a sliding scale. You're so you're more confident some days than others. You're more 
successful some days than others. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of our process. Do I you think we handle would, that well? Uh, I don't know. I don't. I, I think part of it is each believer has different rooms of confidence in God. Okay. And so part of me goes, it's more than just yes or no. It's like, well, I believe in him in my marriage, but not in my fa finances. I believe in him in my finances, but not with my kids. I believe with my kids, but I don't believe with, with my health. So I think that confidence from room to room changes. So that's that becomes a part of our, st our story. Well, let's pick that up a second. That's an interesting idea. So the average Christian who's trying to do these things knows intellectually he has to have faith and he has to have confidence. Yeah. Do you think he would admit to... I, I have confidence in Christ in this area, but not in this area? Or is it he proves that or she more by the actual behavior that they employ? Oh, our, our behaviors tell us our beliefs. Right. Isn't that a fascinating thought? Yeah. Our behaviors tell us our beliefs. So now how does that fit in to the process with some of these things that we have to do? Let's just, let's just go to one of those. So uh, you made the statement you referred to... Uh, to Jim Elliott, that no fool to give up what you can't keep to gain what you can't lose. And that ties in with the process that we are going to be absorbed into Christ, so to mm -hmm. speak. Right. Part of what this text that, you, that you've been looking at and that we looked at today talks about is it's almost as if our personality is somewhat lessened as we become more absorbed and combined with Christ. Not that we're not significant, but the nature of our being changes and we take on more significance because of our relationship to Christ. Or at least that's one way to think about it. Yeah, I would go a different way. I don't think our personality per se changes as we get absorbed into Christ. I think he makes some of us introverts, some of us extroverts, some okay. of us thinkers, some of us feelers, some of us closures, some of us open in, some of us artists, some of us CPAs. I, I don't necessarily think spirit filledness changes those temperaments. I think it changes how we do them. So uh, as a CPA, I might... Or maybe which evidences of your personality you, you, you would uh, put more emphasis on. Because some, some parts of any personality are better than others. Yes. Yeah. And I would say those weaknesses. So let's say somebody has a propensity to be negative. Okay. I think I, if I don't really see that as a personality, I think it's a, it's a ref, reflection of something different. But if, if, if we want to call that a personality, then I would say God is going to take that negative, critical, cynical, um, Eeyore, sort of <laughs> approach and transform that to joy, peace. You know, the fruit of the Spirit is going to change our countenance. I just think we're still going to be the same person, per se. I don't think we get... I don't... I think Christ being formed in us still allows us to be the person God created us to be before the creation of the world. I don't think we lose our identity, even though we take on more identity, i.e., I'm a child, I'm forgiven, you know, I'm blessed, I'm a saint. I mean, the list we, we recited today. But I do think he values, this is where I'm at, I think he values humanity and our humanness. Our, I don't think he's anti-body. I think the Gnostics made that mistake, that, that it's just our thoughts that count, not our bodies. I think God comes to redeem us. Get, he will give us new bodies, mm -hmm. transform. But my guess is, in heaven, I'll see the best of Randy, not the worst of Randy, and you'll see the best of Bill, not the worst of Bill. We're not all going to look alike and sound alike, but the best of us will be there. Mm -hmm. That would be how I would describe it. Okay. I did not mean to imply that our personalities were not part of who we would be, but I think part of what every person I've ever met who has to deal with their unity with Christ is the process of becoming more like Christ, being hidden with Christ, etc. I take that to be we're having to form part of our nature to be closer to that nature of Christ. Yeah, I would agree. So that's yeah. sort of the aspect I was trying to get to. Yeah. Verse 2, we saw, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. As we were talking about that today, it occurs to me 
how much I am surrounded by every kind of conceivable idea at the touch of a hat. Yes. You know, you used to have a conversation with someone, well, what does this mean? Now I might say to my wife, well, I'll Google that. And I actually look it up and I find out 6, 17 details about this minor thing of life. Right. That amount of information and that amount of input and that amount of things to hold your attention right here, I think is a powerful force in society. So how do we in our daily lives do this? How do we set my mind on things above when I am now more than ever confronted by facts, distractions, information of a constant source from multiple levels of impact? How do I accomplish this? How do I think about the spiritual matters that I should be when I'm now even more attuned to the physical issues? And then I think we have the issue that you referred to again in Ephesians 6, that much of what drives those contacts that we have now are from secular, negative, anti-God points of view. Right. What's the process of dealing with that? How do we respond? Uh, here's how I would say. I would say, to the degree that I'm aware of how much the world is pressing in on me through all those mediums, I must counter that with truth. So I need to spend more time in the Word, not less. Okay. Uh, you know, so maybe 50 years ago, somebody could get away with a two-minute devotional out of our daily bread, and I'd say maybe that's up to an hour of Probably study. So. Probably so. I mean, if I'm going to counter the deception, and and it's it's the old, you know, you've used it, I've used it, the, you know, how they used to teach people with counterfeit money. They didn't teach them counterfeit money. They didn't say, here's how counterfeit money is done. They used to, the way legend says, they would give them all day long for a month or two looking at real dollars and having mm -hmm. looked at the real dollars they could identify mm -hmm. the i i think there's a degree that it's probably not a wise thing to go chase down all the lies but find out what the truth is and the truth will help us spot the lies quicker yep so i would say given what you're given all of the mediums all the communication all of the television all of the radio all of the music, I mean, we could just go through it. I, I have to be self-aware to say, how much have I taken in, both of the bad and good, mm -hmm. or gray, and am I inputting my life um, with, with an appropriate amount of truth? And I think that's probably bigger than the average person in that room takes in a day. Mm -hmm. And so we're actually having to do this very intentionally this this these first four verses here are not like some parts of just feel this way about it you know faith is somewhat a feeling as right. well as an intellectual thing we right. have to be intentional about trying to implement in our lives these first four verses no and and, and intentional is the perfect word because seek and set are intentional words they're exactly. commands exactly. so we're commanded it's not like an option it's not like here's some wisdom proverbs these are commands that we are given that makes us intentional to do them. Mm -hmm. And I would say intentionality is key. And I would say we have to replace passiveness with intentionality. Yes. So the whole concept of these first four verses, and I think it's, it's going to be something we're going to have to work at to get to make it practical in our lives, is that it starts with the idea that, what's that phrase? If we are... What's the first verse? And if we are risen with, risen Christ, with Christ, right? right. Yeah. Well, that again is saying that we are we're we're set apart. We are not like anyone else now. We have a different process than we did before, right? And so now we have are going to do these things that are all related to being with Christ, incorporated with Christ, integrated with Christ, which puts us at even more of a conflict with the world we live in, which is definitely not. For sure. So that increases the level of, for us to do successfully what we need to do in these four verses, we're getting higher levels of resistance as we try to buck the trend more of what's normal. Perfect. So given that, you then went to speak with what we see in our society and what was written about long ago. When we first read the book, you and I were young men and it hadn't happened. And now 1984 is history. But some of those things are coming to pass. 
past. This is not Oceania, but we now have real, what is it, real speak? What's new it called? speak. New speak. Yes, new speak is rampant in our society right. in some ways today. So right. retraining what's okay to say and what's not. So how are we as believers going to be effective in dealing with this new speak at the same time that we need to be more than ever an influence in society and our voices do need to be heard? And yet what we're seeing now is a very ingenious process from Satan. It seems to me that if you don't accept new speak, then you are totally out of sync and you have lost any ability to influence the society that you're a part of because you aren't a team player. Mm -hmm. How do we solve that conundrum of putting in these first four verses, becoming more like Christ and still remain relevant and have an impact? Okay. And I, in simple terms, it's a I long would, question. I'm sorry. That's uh, okay. Simple terms is this. Number one, I think, we have to discover that the battle we're fighting isn't out here. The battle we're fighting is here. Oh, that's a good thought. And the pressures that are being placed on me, I can't minimize. I can only increase the pressure inside of me mm -hmm. to counter that. So Christians are trying to change this and running around with their head cut off as opposed to their mind and their heart being fortified, that spirit diagram I described, that the spirit is influencing more and more of our parts of our lives. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. So the, the duality is this. I fortify my heart, my, my spirit, my soul, and out of that having and being indwelt by the Holy Spirit and being like Christ, I leak out love in the midst of the conflicts that I'm going to have because I'm so different than those that are around there. I mean, Jesus' prayer in John 17 was they're going to, they're going to face a whole lot of tribulations, but don't take them out of the world. Right. right. He, I'm going to give them a peace. So the peace starts with me internally. I d understand who my identity is. I understand that Christ is on the throne. I don't have to solve all the problems. Not all the problems are within my scope and responsibility, I am responsible to love. Mm -hmm. That's that's how Jesus wants us to be remembered. Does love gonna win the game? It didn't win with him, he ended nope. up on the cross. Good so point. will we end up on the cross? Maybe, but on the cross, First Peter tells us he did not revile, he did not, he, he responded and, and, and kept entrusting himself to God. I so, just, I think Randy, the scriptures, tell us how to live in Oceana. I think they do. But what I hear you say there is, as I read that verse two, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. The more we are focused on earthly things, the more it's gonna be obvious that we are out of step and will continue to be as it always has been with the current society. And yet we have to remain relevant, but doing it through the processes of how Jesus would have done it. I Showing think. the attitudes, like you said, of love and kindness, yep. listening, and yet he would never agree to something that was improper. If they made untrue statements, right. he would, you know, just let his yes or no be yes or but no. You, so. What's interesting to me is Jesus didn't go looking for fights, though. No, he never did. So he didn't feel like he had to control the culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a we'll run out of time by the end of this, but but one of the things I'm amazed by is that Jesus. In the Gospels, never talks about overthrowing a nope. evil government nope. more evil not. than ours. He never does. He kept he 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 said, "Thy kingdom come." So, I think Jesus' theology, philosophy, strategy was the way to live in any evil world, no matter what world we're in, mm -hmm. is to live out the kingdom values. So, so I would go so far to say that that what the seeking the things that are above would be the would be the values and the virtues of the kingdom of God. Yes. The thought as you were saying those things that comes to my mind is, I can't remember who states it in the New Testament now, so I can get a demerit for that. But as much as within you live at peace with all men. Well, we do that by, as Jesus would often do, he right. would listen to the, the critics speak to him, and he would then answer simply and basically the certain concepts and then not try to browbeat them or go right. forward. He, just, right. he would give that basic answer. And that's probably a key for us. Paul, Paul said that in Romans 12. Okay. 
And and I what I think is beautiful is he said as far as as far as possible as much as possible. That's right. So as so much as in within you, yeah. Paul's understanding, as is Jesus's understanding. Not everybody's going to like us. Not nope. everybody's going to understand us. Right. Uh, being spiritual isn't going to lead us to harmony with everyone. Mm -hmm. But as much as you can, um, live in peace and in the process, always demonstrate love. Yep. You drew on the chart when we got to the third verse, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So one of the things I've noticed is I don't think most people are comfortable with even the idea that they will die. Because as Christians, we talk about all these things, and yet we are often quite disconcerted when people die, mm -hmm. which is understandable. It's, it's right. difficult, but it does happen. So we died, and uh, we have to know that we're hidden with Christ. What would you say in pragmatic words is the genuine meaning of being hidden with Christ while we're still alive? I think it means concealment and security. But what is that? I guess what that means is I've been a believer a long time, and yet so technically I am dead alive in Christ, but here I am, and the same for you. Right. So we're in this world. How do we live as dead people and still be alive? Well, it's a million-dollar question. I, I, think, I think what happens to most Christians is, is, and most people think that his death that he's referring to in chapter 3 is the baptism, the, the, the conversion, the moment that we are buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. So I would but say... That, I agree with that, but that's a symbol of what has now actually happened to us. Right, and, and the symbol is that I'm no longer mine. That's a good illustration. It's, it's now every, I mean, if you want to go to the purest form, every decision I make is for God's glory, right? not my benefit. Um, I'm not in charge anymore. I'm not in charge, and it's not about me, and I might lose in this process, but it doesn't matter because I'm dead already. I've already gained an inheritance. I've already invested in heaven. You can't take it from me. You can't hurt me. In, 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 in an eternal sort of way. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the problem, here's my, in a playful way, I think the problem with most Christians is not they're afraid of physical death. I think the problem for most Christians is they, they're afraid of self-death, that I have to Give live up. the rest of my life worried more about God than me, mm -hmm. exalting Him more than I'm exalted, being about His business, not my business, serving others as if I'm serving that's him. That's extremely hard so, to do. That, right. And so we take the jacuzzi baptism over the uh, baptism shaped like a tomb. Right. That says, and I think the more, I, I don't think you get there so, overnight. So you would say, not to, I interrupt, but I guess I did. You did. You would say that being hidden with Christ would mean this being comfortable with subjugating some of your own natural desires and coming to have Christ's desires instead. I would say it a little different. I think hidden with Christ means that because of the work of Christ, I am, I am secure, I am sealed, I am saved. It's his work, and I'm hidden by his work and his blood, and I'm robed in his righteousness, not my righteousness. So there's, there's security in my hiddenness. That would be one, one component of it. And I think the other component is that I, the, the word hidden there is often used of God, that God is hidden in the heavens. We don't see him. It's the unseen. Right. And I would, so the second part of the hidden is I don't think others or I see who all that I am. It's hidden, and it will be someday manifested in my glory or the glory of me being conformed to the image of Christ will be revealed. So that, that, that becomes well, the duality right. to me. Well, there is, a, there is a tie, though, between the hidden and the fact that you, as the individual, and your desires, etc., have died. You have died, and your life is now hidden. Yeah. So there's an incorporation there. And I guess I think in my own life, and I think most people I know, that is a struggle. That is difficult to give up your personal desires and your personal intents and your daily concerns and make them more Christ-centered because they're very immediate. 
So you drew a little chart that our life tends to fall into sort of four areas, heart, mind, social, and will, the four categories that we do. And spirit was in the middle. And it was a wonderful illustration of how what the ideal is, is as we proceed in our Christianity, the spirit part in the center gets more and more of our four aspects of life, what our heart is and what our mind is and what our social activities are and what our will is. Will, I think, maybe being a very dramatic piece of that. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful illustration, and I would really like to have that happen faster in my own life, and I think most people would. But how do I make that happen? Is the Holy Spirit going to be the key to helping me do that? What is the process that I go through this expansion? It's a great question. So it would be simple terms. It would be scripture, spirit, service, suffering, saints are all fingers that God uses to shape me. Um, Say those again. Scripture. Well, scripture. Spirit. I don't know if I'll get it all in the same order. Fine. Uh, wait, scripture, spirit, suffering, mm -hmm. uh, supplication, okay. prayer, service. Okay. So the more I'm engaged in those, the more I'm allowing Christ to be formed in me. And as I'm, is that uh, your girlfriend? It's my uh, broke, my bookie. <laughs> He's determined. So it, 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 that's not in the least bit of it. It, uh, it is. It, it is participating with him in this, uh, giving up more and more ground to my old. We'll get into this in verses five and following. It's giving up more of my old nature to the new nature, relinquishing more territory so that God can work within my life. And is and it's an ever growing, very slow, methodical march. But I, I think the key is that I was trying to say today is that the depth of spirituality is a depth of humanity, and we separate the two. That the truth is the more spiritual I become, the more human I am. Human the way God wanted me, not human based on what I am in the fall. Got it. And I see that we are now have used our time. Okay, it went quickly. you get one more question. We get one more question. So, uh, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Verse 4. Mm -hmm. How real do you think that is to most of us in our daily lives? That we really, really grasp and are totally back to the beginning confident in the fact that I will be there with Christ in the eternity. You know, I don't know. I, I don't know what level of confidence people have that Jesus could come back this afternoon or a thousand years from now. I don't know how much confidence they have that because of what Christ has done, they don't have to be afraid of his appearing. Right. Um, and because of what he has done and their hiddenness and all that they've become in those 15 IMs, that they will, they will be like him in the twinkling of an eye, mm -hmm. transformed, glorified, and all the journey of trying to become like Christ here on earth will be perfected in that moment. I think that's a great answer. And I wanted to close with that because, as I understand it, it should be the source of total confidence. It should be the source of the greatest peace we can have in life to know that despite whatever happens in life, how well you do it or how poorly in your specific activities, your affiliation with Christ means you cannot fail in the thing that matters most. And I think that's where I wish we could spend more time. That's where I hope our study of Colossians does for us, it brings us to a more confidence and clarity on that matter. And that's why I think the first couple of chapters of Colossians, he makes such an impact about Christ is everything. He is overall, he's all that really matters. So the more we can grasp that concept, the more effective I think we'll be in dealing with whatever society gives to us or whatever difficulties in life or whatever. So yes. keep up the good work on this teaching. Okay. 
You going to pray us out? I think I should. Okay. God, we ask that you would bless everyone who is thinking about you today. We ask that you would bless every person in our fellowship, the people who are taking part of our studies and reading along in Colossians. We ask God that you would empower your spirit on just a regular and daily basis in the lives of each of us to help us be better in our understanding and to help us most of all grow our confidence and our desire to be willingly hidden in Christ and He being our lives. We thank you for Pastor Bill's leadership and for all you've done for us as we grow towards you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Have a great day.